Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 94 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies, knife junkies, anybody who is interested in knives. Well, you're in the right spot because you can learn about knives, knife collecting, hear from the knife designers, the makers, the manufacturers, YouTube reviewers, anyone who loves knives, the Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for you. And Bob, I, I know some of our interviews, you've asked questions about grail knives and those mm-hmm. kind of things. Yeah. I, I'm assuming that today's interview is a grail interview for you. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, Jim. That's exactly what it is. It's a grail interview. Today, I'm talking with Ernest Emerson, my favorite knife designer and uh, someone that I've always looked up to for a long time, not just for his uh, his amazing knives, uh, but also for his story uh, and his background in martial arts and uh, just as a as a fighter. And uh, that's where all of his knives came from. And you know what? I'm gonna just going to stop talking because we had a great conversation and I'll let him fill in the details. But yeah, this was this was awesome. Well, sounds like a plan. Let's get to it. Ever order a knife online and have it delivered to the office so your wife doesn't know? Chances are you're a knife junkie. I wanted to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It is such welcome. a pleasure to have you on. I love to talk about anything <laughs> <laughs> all right well we'll wind you up and let you go <laughs> <laughs> like i said be careful <laughs> well so i wanted to open up with a, a a bruce lee quote that i've heard you mention before and and it's a quote that i like but i, I want to find out what it means to you and and, and uh, i think this is gonna launch us into this conversation about knives and and that's before i learned the art a punch was just a punch and a kick was just a kick after I learned the art, a punch was no longer a punch, a kick no longer a kick. Now that I understand the art, a punch is just a punch, and a kick is just a kick. What does that mean? Well, what it means is you have to learn to unlearn and get down to the basics. Now, something that goes along with that, I think, is another mantra that we use in, in my classes is uh, an expert is one who has mastered the basics. And it is true of any person uh, when they become enamored uh, in any way, shape, or form for a new endeavor that you want to know everything there is to know about it. Pros, cons, ins and outs, looking at it from all different sides. Uh, and it takes an educational process and an experiential process uh, to sift through that. Sometimes that takes, uh, depending on the complexity of what it is that you're you're attempting to do or learn uh, it can take a year, can take five years, can take almost a lifetime for some people. But you get to the point where, holy smokes, all of that other stuff is just, that's just side notes on that piece of paper. The, the only thing that really matters is what's written right down the center of the, of the page, and that is the basics. And what Bruce, at least my interpretation of what Bruce meant was, uh, you know what? A punch is just a punch. It doesn't matter what you name it, where it came from, what angle it's coming from or whatever. He also said, I want you to be able to, when someone asked him one time, uh, where are the, where are the uh, pressure points or the, or the nerve endings or whatever it is that I should be looking for to, to attack or strike. And Bruce said, I don't care about any of that. I just want you to be able to hit so hard that it doesn't matter where you hit the guy. You're going to do damage. And I think that in regard to that statement, a punch is just a punch and a kick is just a kick. Once you've understood the art, it really does go back to, it's almost a Zen, it probably is a Zen thing, you know, where he, where he got that. Because I, I know the original quote, it was a, a leaf was just a leaf and a, mm, a, a mm. tree was just a tree. But anyway, the what it comes down to is the fact that really, an expert is one who has mastered the basics because the basics carry you through uh, for a lifetime. All of the, all of the fluff and all of the, again, if we just look at the martial arts, if you will, all of the very complex things that we spend so many years trying to be able to learn how to do, you get to the point where it's like, I'll never be able to do that. 
I'll never be able to do it in a high stress environment against an unwilling, uh, uh, non compliant opponent. I've just got to get in there and hit as hard as I can. I just got to learn how to hit as hard as I can, and and that's that's kind of my interpretation of that. Long winded, but no, no. I, I mean, he had a great way of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater by kind of dividing it into self perfection and self preservation. Some of the things you're going to learn, like the basics, like mastering the basics, are going to help you stay alive. These other things, these mm-hmm. fancy things, are going to help you move and and get attributes. You know. But other than that, they don't have the practical street value. Yeah. Well, the thing is also, again, it, it, just to segue into the, into the uh, combat arts for a second, I got it. I understand how people love, the com- you know, love things that are complex. I, I got it. I was there, and I, I did it for many, many years. It's fun, and uh, it gives you a lot of benefit if you will. But for me, my whole life was about the only thing that I wanted to learn how to do was to be able to fight better. So uh, if it didn't work, or if it's something I had to spend a lot of time on, uh, I didn't have the time to do that. So again, it was a matter of stripping away, just like Bruce had always said, you know, you you have to learn all of this so you can learn what to throw out or, Mm -hmm. or discard. And again, each person is an individual has different physical characteristics and, and mental um, acuities and all that. So it, everyone's martial art is a separate expression of themselves. And I think that's one, of, again, getting off on a tangent. That's mm-hmm. one of the reasons Bruce, you know, declined to ever open up schools, if you will. He had a couple yeah. here and there. But one of the things I think that's important in what I'm trying to describe is that for me, I just wanted to be able to do the basics better. Uh, and that's what I found was always the thing that was going to carry the, carry the day in, in fighting or training or mm-hmm. knife making or anything else. So anyway. Well, you said that uh, from the very start, what you wanted to do was be a fighter and be a better and better fighter. Describe that path. Uh, it started early, I think. Uh, it did. And uh, I, I was subscribed to Black Belt Magazine in, in 1963 and 1964 when it was still... Uh, available. I'm from northern Wisconsin uh, in a little tiny town, a rural, rural area. And uh, I used to go into the drugstore and and pick up the latest uh, Black Belt magazine. And finally, I subscribed to it. And so that was probably at, at in 60, I'm sorry, not 63 or 64, 67, uh, 68. Uh, that put me at about uh, 11 or 12 years old. So I had an interest in in karate if you will (laughs) at that time and uh one thing led to another and lo and behold the uh tv show kung fu came on with david carradine and it was like oh my god (laughs) those are shaolin monks you know they can (laughs) they can throw those shurikens and they can you know (laughs) shoot bows and arrows without looking at the target you know i mean it's like holy smokes man that's what i want to do and uh you know so again buying all the books and things from the back of black belt uh, an O'Hara publications it was, practicing katas and things like that. I didn't have the ability to go to a school uh, because I was in a little tiny town in northern Wisconsin in the 60s. So there were no karate schools or kung fu schools or anything like that. So I had to end up, I found uh, YMCA in Duluth, Minnesota, which was 80 miles north. <laughs> and uh, so I drove two times a week, 80 miles each way when I got to be 16 to go to the YMCA and study. A, 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 there was a guy there that taught a Korean judo. They called it Jodo at, at mm. that time. And so I went up there, you know, I drove 320 miles a week, uh, basically just to go and spend an hour uh, in those classes when I was 16. And then I'm, tr- I'm going to try and make this kind of short. It's a long story. But uh, <laughs> then I went to see my first Bruce Lee movie. Oh, and man. oh my gosh, that... Uh, that was the Which eye-opening one? thing. Which movie? Uh, was Fist it? of Fury. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In the ice factory. Yeah, yeah. Where he hit the guy and he went through the wall and he had perfect outline of his body <laughs> through the wood. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was a big knife movie. That was probably the biggest Bruce Lee knife movie. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> what that maybe that planted part of that seed. Right. But anyway, so I went I saw that, then I ended up going to school and I played football on a football scholarship and a lot of other stuff in, in betwixt and between. I ended up playing 
uh, minor league baseball and et cetera, et cetera. Wow. But I still, I still trained uh, every moment that I could in, in Kung Fu, if you will, uh, and everything. And uh, one of the black belts that I picked up somewhere in that time showed the school uh, with Dan Inosanto and Richard Bastillo as the, the Filipino Cali Academy was the school in Los Angeles that Bruce had uh, passed his, the laurels or the legacy down to Danny and Richard and those guys to uh, open up a school and teach uh, JKD, Jikundo, and Filipino martial arts, etc. So I pulled up uh, stakes, uh, loaded up the truck, and I, I moved to Beverly. Uh, wow. down, I moved to California and uh, came out here just to go to that school. And it was interesting, too, because uh, I'd been around a lot of other schools and had been on the university karate team and all that good stuff. So I was, I had been exposed to, I guess, professional martial arts, if you will. But when I got to the Cali Academy, I, I went in to sign up. They said, no, 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 you, you can't sign up. Uh, you have to wait. We, we, we don't do that. We don't take people <laughs> into the class. You have to wait until we start a new phase. So we'll put you on the list and we'll contact you. So about two or three months later, I get a, I get a postcard uh, that said, you're the, a new phase is opening up. Come on down and, and sign up if you still want to go. So again, it was like, how weird is that? Because almost, I mean, without exception, every other martial arts school in the world, if you walk through the door with a checkbook in your hand or whatever, yeah. you were going to, you were going to get in. Yeah. And these guys turned me down basically, not, not because of me or anything, but right. that they were like, no, you got to wait. The integrity of the arts or something. I guess. So anyway, uh, that, that led to uh, why I made knives. And I, and I, I know we're going to go in that direction. Uh, so let me just tell you the, the rest of that little short story. So yeah. I was at the Cali Academy. And of course, Danny and, and Richard were both uh, Filipinos. And so when it came to edge weapons and all that, it was all over the place. But they had these darn knives that were butterfly knives. And I was like, oh, my God, that's that's the most <laughs> awesome thing. That's the most awesome thing since Nunchakus, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I couldn't afford uh, to buy one because at the time they were being made by a company called Pacific uh, Cutlery. Ah. And uh, they were like $125 to $150 a piece. And I was like, oh, my God, that's like $10 million at that time because I right, couldn't. Right. There were times when I couldn't even afford the uh, – uh, the dues at the school, which were only $12 and 50 cents a month. So Dan or Richard would say, Hey, just go clean the bathrooms and sweep the floors and we'll, we'll call it even. That's cool. But anyway, back to the knives. Uh, I couldn't afford those knives and I thought, damn, you know what? I mean, I grew up on a farm. I was, I was around equipment and machines and everything else my entire life. And so I thought, man, I could probably make one of those. And, you know, I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be a, uh, as good as a Pacific knife, Pacific cutlery knife, but I, I could make something that I could play with. Right. And so uh, I got some tool steel, I drills, drilled some holes and some aluminum and et cetera, et cetera, and uh, made my first knife, which was a butterfly knife. Found out there were several guys at the school that were also as poor as I was. <laughs> and they said, hey, you know, could you make me one of those knives? And I said, well, if you pay for the aluminum and the, and the steel, I'll, I'll make you a knife. Now, these were very crude, don't get me wrong. But, well, it, it, let me back up for a second. The, when I went to make one, I didn't have one. And uh, so I went to mm -hmm. Richard Bastillo and I said, could I uh, see your knife? And so he showed me his knife and I said, would you mind if I, if I copied this and made it? Uh, and his was, you know, one made in the Philippines. So it's mm -hmm. it, it, very effective, but not highly finished and all that, too. So gotcha. I said, could can I copy this knife or make one of these knives? He said, go ahead, take it home, you know, and uh, bring it back uh, when you're done. So I, that was a Thursday. I took it home over the weekend or whatever few days. I, I cobbed this thing together and brought my knife. I mean, I filed the blade with a, with a file and, you know, cut it out with a hacksaw uh -huh. and, you know, hand drilled the pivots and blah, blah, blah. All right. So anyway, brought it back and Richard uh, gave him his knife and he said, well, let me see what you did. And so uh, I handed him the knife and he said, well, he goes, it's not good, but, but it'll do. And then I was like, oh, nice. that's, that's awesome. <laughs> For a first <laughs> and knife. This, yeah. And this guy was like one of my heroes. I mean, I moved all the way. I, I uprooted my entire existence to come and stand in his presence. And uh, 
anyway, so that started the the knife making, and then you know Pacific Cutlery. Uh, I don't know if if all of your listeners know that, but that was the precursor to uh, Benchmade, ah, right? And that was Les Deasis, uh company. And they moved up to Oregon where they could make switchblades and, and ballet songs and all that legally because Oregon had different laws than mm-hmm. California. And uh, the ironic thing about it is if you go ahead uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, I was standing in the office offices at Benchmade with, with Les and, and uh, Roberta designing the first CQC7. So the reason that I made my first knife was I couldn't afford to buy one that was made by Benchmade, if you will. Right. And then 25, 30 years later, I'm standing in Benchmade's office, the engineering office, designing a knife for him. That's so, what an amazing what a circle. huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wide one, too. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so were you involved in aerospace engineering? I, I mean, I know you were in mm-hmm. some regard. Did, did that help? in, in uh, giving you the confidence to, to go ahead and start making these things? Well, uh, it, 100% it helped uh, because I got a job as an auto mechanic at the university. I, st- I also was still going to school out here too. So uh, I got a job at the university as a uh, auto mechanic. And one day someone said, hey, there's a, there's a night job opening up over in the machine uh, department for a tool crib attendant. So I said, okay, I'll take that because, you know, again, my entire life really has just been about being sure I had a job or Mm -hmm. two jobs or three if I had to. So I said, yeah, I'll take that job. So I went over there and applied and got the job. And all of a sudden I was like, holy smokes, this is cool stuff. These are machines. These are (laughs) lathes and mills and all of that other good stuff. So one of the guys that was one of the instructors there was also a, uh, a head of an entire department at Hughes Aircraft. And uh, we hit it off pretty good. And he let me go out and work on the machines once in a while. And uh, one day he came to me and he said, hey, uh, Ernie, I, uh, I have an opening at, at Hughes uh, for an entry level machinist. Would you would you be interested in coming to work for us? And I was like, yeah, no kidding. I mean, to get paid to do this and get taught a craft. So anyway, long story again, I ended up working at Hughes, worked my way up through uh, prototype machinist, uh, tool and die maker. Then they gave me an engineering uh, position because I was a tool oh, nice. tool designer and uh, mechanical engineer, if you will. They make, uh, Hughes makes helicopters? Well, th- it was Hughes helicopters at one time. That was a division, but I was in what it's called space and communications, which was all... Uh, satellites that they, they had a commercial sector and a military sector I, I i worked in the military sector and it was it was very cool i mean this is no bullshit uh uh we had lead line rooms and, uh, <laughs> i mean it was cool. it was really cool uh i had various degrees of uh secret clearance if you will and uh, you couldn't couldn't have cell phones you couldn't have radios you couldn't have any outside communications stuff like that because we were working on at that time was they were called keyhole projects and uh-huh. those were uh, our state-of-the-art surveillance satellites for nsa and all that other good stuff so it was a lot wow. of fun i i had a dream job it was uh it was a department where do you guys think we could do this let's give it a try let's build it and and it was cool so how do you go from that kind of a dream job Working at a place oh, like that with top secret clearance, you know, <laughs> building satellites for the NRO to, uh, I'm going to make knives and see how this works out. Well, I had never not stopped making knives and had was doing it on the, after I got home from work and on weekends as a hobby. Because I just, I love knives. I, would, I grew up in a, in a hunting, fishing, farming environment. So they were part of your, it was just the same as carrying a wallet was mm-hmm. carrying a knife. So it was part of my, I guess, DNA. <laughs> DNA. And uh, at some point, my wife and I went to a gun show that was uh, the Pasadena gun show. And it was supposed to be one of the world's largest gun shows. And yeah, six miles of aisles and all that <laughs> good stuff. So we went out there and I was nosing around and I saw this uh, one building because they had all these giant like uh, warehouse type buildings, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, fairground type buildings. And uh, I walked into one and... It was. It happened to be the knife makers section, mm. and I was like, "What the heck is that?" And uh, walked up 
to these tables that they had kind of lined up. And there was a section with there was about 15 or 20 quote unquote knife makers there. And I think Mel Pardue was one and Michael Walker was there. And wow. A couple of other guys. I can't can't remember because at that time I didn't even know who they were. Right. But uh, I was like, wow, what's this? You know, do you guys make knives? And you go, yeah, that's what we do. And I said, well, what else do you do? And they go, no, this is this is what <laughs> this is Mel Pardue. He goes, this is what I do. I, I make knives. And I was like, are you kidding me that you can actually exist and support yourself by making knives? And he said, yeah. So anyway, I bought a book by a guy named Sid Latham at the show mm. and uh, Knives and Knife Makers. And I didn't even know they existed before I walked through that door. And from that point forward, I, I became very serious about upping my education about how to make knives and looking at you know the, the, the state of the art at the time of what was out there. And uh, got to the point where, you know, people actually were paying me to for what I made, which I reinvested back in a new drill press or a new grinder or a new you know set of drills or whatever the heck it happened to be, which I thought was very cool and was mm -hmm. easy for my wife because I was I had a hobby that actually paid for itself. <laughs> and, in, right. and several times I had a few dollars left over to go out to eat. So she was happy with that, except that <laughs> you know, I didn't spend much time inside the house. But. Anyway, that led from one thing to the next, and uh, you know, here we are today. I mean, I, I I just fell in love with making knives, and I I still love every every second that I do it. And so people know you for your for your tactical knives, but what describe what those first knives looked like, the first folders, and tell me a little bit about how you hooked up with the liner lock. Well, the uh, the first folders. Once I got past the, uh, the 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 crude folders, if you would, and and, mm. and if you will, and tried to make knives that I could actually present to someone who might want to buy it. They were pretty fancy. They used a lot of natural materials, bone and ivory and and wood and stuff like that, power shell and, and mother of pearl. Uh, I used titanium because for two reasons. I absolutely fell in love with uh, the knives that were being made by Michael Walker, uh, who, who had probably some of the best overall designed and um, knives that I've, in my opinion, that, that, that I'd ever run across. Mm -hmm. uh, they just had a, a flow to them that I've, that I've tried to emulate myself over the years. But they were fancy and they were pretty and they were anodized and you could only do that with titanium. So mm -hmm. I was like, well, it looks like I got to start doing that with titanium. So the first knives that, that I made uh, were the fancier knives. They were the highly colored blues and purples and reds of, of the anodized titanium. And the liner lock, of course, because that's what Michael had basically pioneered in the uh, knife industry, I was you know, going to make that style of knife. That's what I decided to make because I had looked at lock backs and slip joints and all that as mm -hmm. I was kind of learning the craft. And uh, I really did like the liner lock for a bunch of reasons, but being a an actual knife user, I mean, a real, real knife user for for real, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things, things that were functional at a, or more efficient or more functional than, than what you know, was uh, else was out there, I always gravitated towards that. And so the liner lock presented to me a very good tool and a way to open a knife with one hand. And also, uh, because I was at the time still training every day, was like, hmm, I don't have to, even though I could open a Spyderco with one hand generally, with the hole in the in the blade and everything, it was a lock back, and it was a little bit tougher to manipulate to get into an open position. The liner lock was like kaboom, and it was in your hand. So, mm. uh, you know, this this was all one thing influenced the other, and so I looked at the liner lock and said it's a perfect tactical application also because it's a it's a quick one hand opening type of knife because again think about a gun you don't want to have to use two hands to unholster your gun and bring right. it up to to at, at least until you you know get it uh push forward in, in your shooting stance and all that if you will with two hands same thing with a knife you know if i have to use it in a high stress environment or an emergency situation i need to have it out and open uh, as quickly as i can cuz Time is life and death. Right? Of the essence. And of course, this brings me to the wave. The wave is, <laughs> is one of the things you're known for. 
Oh, for sure. That's that innovation. Tell me the story. I know you've told it a million times, mm-hmm. but I love this story. Tell me the story about how you got, how this yeah. was developed. Well, I wish I could tell you it was all my idea and I was a real Einstein and figured this all out, but it, that's unfortunately not the way it happened. It was discovered by accident, really. And um, well, I'm sorry, before you go forward, let's yeah. tell anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. The wave, <laughs> uh, the wave opening feature is, is a feature on almost every Emerson knife uh, on the back where your thumb rests. And uh, it deploys the knife as you, uh, it deploy, deploys the blade as you pull the handle from your pocket. It's uh, the hook snags on your pocket, cams mm-hmm. the blade open, boom, faster than any other knife, including a switchblade. Okay. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, so anyway, what had happened is I was working, again, all this stuff is, is so intertwined and it's just kind of funny how it keeps re-intertwining all the time. <laughs> Uh, I, I had been a, an instructor for a group called GSGI that was, uh, all set up by all former SEAL Team 6, uh, members that were part of Dick's, Dick Marcinko's, uh, original, um, they were all plank owners and out of SEAL Team 6. And we went around doing all this training and teaching and security evaluations and all that good stuff. And that put me in touch with uh, a lot of, at that time, current, uh, Naval Special Warfare personnel, because some of the guys were still actually uh, in service. In fact, one of my friends, uh, Danny Chalker, ran the entire uh, U.S. Navy BUDS uh, program for several years down in Coronado. So he, he was he was the man. And uh, he put me in contact with a bunch of, of people down at, uh, at the base. And one of those groups was uh, combat fighting course instructors. And they were they were, uh, again, they had one of those dream jobs because what they were tasked with was just traveling all over the world wherever uh, the, the road would lead them to figure out uh, better tools, better fighting capabilities. And I mean, honest, these guys were, these were some studs and they went all over learning every kind of martial art and everything that you, wow. could, you could possibly get to distill down into a basic fighting course, you know, for hand-to-hand uh, aspects and uh Special warfare. But anyway, they contacted me about doing a knife that had some type of a catch on the top of the blade just in case it was ever engaged with any other uh, edge weapon or anything that might stop the the knife from sliding up the top of the spine of the blade onto your hands or wrist. And so I developed that little hook type uh, thing for the knife and uh, it looked kind of like a wave. And being you know, at the time I was doing some surfing and all that, it's like, <laughs> damn, we'll just call it the wave because it looks just like a, a wave down here in Southern California. And so uh, they came up to my house because I live about 90 miles north of Coronado. And uh, to- I told them I had the prototypes ready. And they came to the house and picked them up. And they're like, okay, this is cool. This will work, et cetera, et cetera. And we drank a few beers and talked about a lot of cool stuff. And then they decided time to go back to... Uh, San Diego. And I had kept one of the prototypes uh, for myself and I had it in my pocket and went to pull it out and it caught on the edge of my pocket and it partially pulled the blade open. And I was like, oh man, that's not good. That's not good at all. You know, you could, you could, you know, pull out a knife and it's like half open, like, damn, I gotta, I gotta get a hold of these guys and let them know. So pulled it out of my pocket again well, by gosh, it opened the knife, pulled it out again, opened the knife, pulled it out again faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden I was like, holy smack, this damn thing opens a knife every time you pull it out of your pocket. So it's immediately de- deployed. It's in your hand in the right position that if you ever had to use it. So I'm reaching for the phone and the phone, this is no kidding. I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. As I'm reaching for the phone in my garage, the phone rings and it's a guy named Mike and he goes, Ernie. He goes, what the F? He goes, do you know what this knife does? It effing opens up when you pull it out of your pocket. I go, <laughs> I go you got to be kidding me. I just figured that out myself. And he goes, oh, yeah, and it opens up beer bottles too. Uh, <laughs> the most important thing, right? Yeah. But that was the story, and that's how it happened. It was uh, almost one of those accidental things, but uh, we ran with it, and uh, – it, it, it became something that was actually a required feature on any of the knives that we made for any uh, military groups 
over the years. So that was part of the requirement. Had to have that. That yes, was almost sir. your 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 USP. So mm-hmm. what was the um like how how soon after you and uh, Mike simultaneously figured out did you realize you had something on your hands that that needed to be patented or you know protected and utilized mm-hmm. right away actually because again the teaching and training that I was doing I was like oh my god this is crazy because you know one of the things that you have to that we actually trained people how to do was of course access your weapons under high stress mm-hmm. and that, that's everything from when I say weapons that wasn't just knives that was primary weapons secondary weapons uh, I mean we we were doing training uh, at, at an extremely high level for a bunch of different agencies both here and and abroad and so it was everything from handguns long rifles sniper uh, everything that we had experts in that field for and so the thing about a weapon is the only time you're ever going to dep- you know access the weapon is if you need it and mm-hmm. if you need it it's going to be an emergency and situation and so you want to be able to access that weapon under stress and still bring it into a usable deployable position whether that's a handgun or a long gun or 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 a knife or anything else so I realized it Im- immediately that the ability to uh, get a knife open with one hand, even if you were wrestling around with someone on the ground where you you can't uh, use two hands to do something, you could reach that knife and pull it out and have it open so that you could defend yourself and stuff yep. like that. So. Yeah, the the wave is all gross motor and, the, and mm-hmm. everything else, the thumb stud, the, the hole, the flipper, those are all uh, fine motor skill. It, yeah, and it seems like in a in a in a clinch, and snagging that thing out of your pocket open is the way to go. Yeah, and again, uh, you know, people don't understand what it's like when uh, when you're when you're geared up, uh, you're covered with with stuff from uh, your ballistic vest to all of your to everything that you would carry on your uh, assault vest or anything else. There's a lot of stuff going on. And people still have the uh, idea of uh, saving Private Ryan where all the soldiers carry everything in a backpack or Mm -hmm. a rucksack. Uh, That's not the case now because all these guys are in in vehicles, at least uh, getting to and from uh, deployment. And sometimes even in, you know, there's a lot of fighting that takes place in and out of vehicles now because, you know, roadside ambushes and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, you know, so your gear's mounted basically on the front because you can't, you can't sit in a car seat or a, or a, the seat of a of a troop carrier with a with a backpack on, so everything's mounted on your on the front, and uh, you can't. I can't even when I'm all chalked up and all that stuff. Uh, I can't even hardly reach around to my right pocket with my left hand. So right. again, you, you need to be able to uh, you know get at whatever it is, whether it's your your the next magazine or your knife or your. Uh, Whatever it has to be, it has to be a gross motor skill, generally doable with one hand, because again, it's just the nature of the environment that you're in. And of course, if you're ever in a in a in an IED situation or something like that, uh, we found also that you could deploy that knife even if you couldn't open it out of your pocket. Let's say you're laying on your side, uh, and you're let's say you're, I'm right-handed, my left hand is is compromised somehow. Uh, I could still open that knife by snagging it on uh, my gear or webbing uh, or or anything just to get that knife open. Friends of mine uh, in Kali class have played around with your trainers in opening them on each other, you know, mm-hmm. pushing each other, pulling it out, opening it on their shirt. Yeah. And then, yeah that's, that's that a could lot leave of... a mark. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be. <laughs> So, so what was the um, what was the tactical folding knife atmosphere at the time when you discovered the wave? You must have been run into the patent office, like well, yeah, which competition at the time? What was going on in that world? Well, we have to back up just a bit, but yes, we did. I realized that that was a an important thing, and uh, I I applied for a patent probably within a week or so after after kind of discovering all this and that. So. That happened right away because we knew that was going to be an important thing. And, and again, you know, there's just a lot of guys out there making a lot of good stuff. So, you know, you're always looking for something that will separate you from the rest of the herd, if mm-hmm. you will. It has to be legit. It has to be real. Right. But whether it's good design or, or, or beautiful fancy work or special materials no one else could use, those, those are the things that, you know, a lot of knife makers uh, 
you know, they, they fall into those things because that is what separates a lot of them. So anyway, the tactical knife at the time of the commander, the first knife that had the wave on it, the tactical knife industry had just started to gestate. And there, I would say that when I was designing the CQC7 knife for Benchmade, somewhere in the mid-90s, that's 93, 94, 95, something like that, mm -hmm. um, there was another knife out there uh, by a good friend of mine, actually, a guy named Chris Karachi, uh, who also was a SEAL Team 6 plank owner, mm -hmm. had developed the AFCK. And those, in my opinion, honest, not to try and grab, you know, the glory, but those two knives, in my opinion, were the first tactical knives, folding knives, modern tactical folding knives that existed. And they set the stage for the rest of the entire industry. And, you know, people say, well, now you're saying you're the first guy to, you know, do a tactical knife. I, I saw xyz do it before <laughs> you and all that and I, I always tell them look dude you have to understand something there was rock and roll before there was elvis presley <laughs> <laughs> but when elvis presley came along he owned rock and roll right, right. and uh after that knife was introduced by benchmade it became basically one of the best selling knives in, in the history of the cutlery industry wow. uh, it was by far the because it was basically the one of two uh tactical knives if you will that existed it was the number one selling tactical knife of all times. Benchmade went from a, a about 25 people uh, employed to three shifts and I think over 90 some people within about a nine or 12 month period just to produce the Emerson CQC7. So, well, so what was it about <laughs> that knife in particular? That, that I mean, so that blew up that company. What What did people love about that knife so much? Well, uh, several things. Uh, when you when you introduced a a new product to an industry that has uh, a status quo that's been established for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, if you will, there has to be something that is different enough, but not goofy different, mm -hmm. and it has to be a legitimate in function and in usage and um, in, in what you tell people that it's going to do, so to speak. And the CQC7 had enough of those differences to make it something new and exciting, but yet it worked. It was a very efficient cutting tool. Uh, again, I did not develop the chisel grind. Uh, the man who pioneered that was a guy, uh, Phil Hartsfield, uh, who I who I had the privilege of knowing and, and meeting and, and talking to him about the chisel grind and all that. In fact, it was I asked him if he would allow me to make a chisel grind, and he said, as long as you don't make fixed blades, just make folders. And I said, no, <laughs> uh, I'll make a bunch of folders. Eventually, I did make some fixed blades, which he was okay with too, because he he didn't see it as a as a challenge to to him or any of his customers. All right. But uh, yeah, he said you're the only guy who ever asked me permission. Uh, to do that. And, and it's funny because when I first made the first liner lock, uh, I called Michael Walker and I asked him for permission uh, if he would mind. And he goes, he told me the same thing. You're the first guy who's ever, ever asked permission. That's you know, cool. That's, he goes, that's cool. He goes, go, go right ahead. You can go and, into that venture with a, with a clear heart. You know? Well, you know, it, it's like everything else. Uh, we've, I can look anybody directly in the eyes uh, that I've ever dealt with and know that, uh, we can sit down and have a beer. I mean, it's really been like that. And that's not to say I haven't had some ups and downs with, with people, but uh, sure. that's just the nature of <laughs> humanity. Being an Irish son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 There's that too, yes. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to Ireland in about three weeks. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, so I'm going over there, trying to trying to see if I can hook up with uh, Connor, because uh, uh, we've, we've crossed paths several times in the past, but... Now, I've never sat down with him and, and you know, shared one of his proper 12 whiskeys with him. That should be interesting. That happen. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the state of the tactical knives at that time was there are no tactical knives. And lo and behold, within about, uh, I'd say maybe a year and a half, almost all the knife companies now had a, at least a section. If, if they had 100 products in their, in their uh, catalog, 
they had about 10 or 15 tactical knives. Mm. And, you know, the, the thing about that was I remember, again, the, I won't tell you the names because they're, they'd be embarrassed, but two of the biggest knife companies that are out there, and we, we all know each other, all the, all the owners and presidents and all that, we all, we all know each other and, and communicate about things. And especially now with all the, the restrictive laws that are going on, we have to have a mm -hmm. real good line of communication between all our, our entities. But two of them at separate times came up to me, uh, one guy actually in a restroom uh, at one of the big shows, and said, Ernie, uh, thank God you came along because you, you changed the face of the cutlery industry and brought an energy to, to something that was just floating along, you know, down the stream without any paddles. Jeez. And I was like, wow, what a compliment. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I like to do. But the cool thing was I realized that a lot of other people liked the same things that I liked. And it's like everything else. If you, if you look at, uh, let's say the advances in, uh, the medical profession, a lot of times, uh, especially emergency medicine, it gets these big spikes whenever there's a war. And uh, we have our greatest uh, speed of evolution for new techniques and new treatments and new emergency uh, procedures due to the fact that all of a sudden there's, there's thousands of emergencies that have to be treated. And it's unfortunate what causes it, but it's a fortunate uh, byproduct mm -hmm. of, of a war, if you will. Well, the same thing happens with, with guns and tactical gear and knives and, you know, clothing, all of the other stuff. Uh, whenever there's a war, there's a, there's a huge influx of influence from either the new needs, the mm -hmm. new materials, uh, the new environments that people are in. So that was right around Gulf One or at the end of Kosovo and, and all of that action. And then right around uh, Gulf One that all of these soldiers uh, were tr transitioning back and forth uh, to civilian life and all that. And they they like knives and they like weapons and they like all of that stuff. The tactical industry literally exploded, basically. So, yeah, we, we were part of the edged, the sharp end of, of that explosion. It's interesting. Uh, I n had not looked at it that way, but that makes total sense. And we've been in, uh, you know, a number of different wars ever since, you know, it's yeah. kind of been a, Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't even want to call it a silver lining because it's war. But I mean, in a sense, it's kind of kept the appetite for this kind of stuff uh, humming along. Yeah, it has. And, and it, it isn't, of course, just weapons. I mean, all of the other, I mean, the, the best inventors on earth are, are working for all of the defense industries and all that. Right. And they develop new materials, new techniques for all the electronics and the satellite Tra trauma stuff. as you yeah. like. And of course that, yes. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm holding my peace arc right now. And, and there are two things on this I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to, I want to loop back to the chisel grind, which you're known for, um, and talk about it, uh, in, in terms of, uh, its efficacy. Why, what, what, what made you choose the chisel grind when there are so a uh, few other makers doing that? Well, once again, I'd like to tell you that I'm Einstein, but <laughs> I'm just a knife maker. <laughs> and what happened was I was a custom knife maker, uh, going to those shows now that, uh, uh, including the Pasadena Gun Show, uh, now sitting on the other side of the of the table. And uh, I was at a show that used to be put on by a guy named Dan Delavan. It was his, uh, actually it was his father at the time. And uh, it was a Southern California knife show. And so I'm sitting at my table one day, one day of the show. And these three guys came up and they were all kind of disheveled surfer looking guys, with long hair and beards and stuff. And I thought, oh, Okay, you know, my knives cost like five or six hundred bucks a piece. These, <laughs> these are some looky loos. <laughs> and they said, you know, uh, Mr. Emerson, uh, we're we're underwater welders, <laughs> yeah. and we're looking for a knife that we can use in the water and marine environment, and we need to be scrape barnacles off things, and when we weld, and you know, the whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. Fair enough, and. Uh, they said, we, we have some of these knives uh, made by a guy named Phil Hartsfield. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I know, I know of, of Phil. And they go, man, they're really strong and they're super sharp and they really don't break. And we were wondering if you might 
be interested in making a folding version of some of those knives. And that's, that's when I actually called Phil. And anyway, I said, wow, that'd be cool. Uh, this will be fun. So made some knives. They actually requested the chisel grind because of the large cross-sectional mass of it. The uh, fact that you can put a, I mean, you can put a hair splitting mm-hmm. edge on a, on a chisel, let alone a chisel knife. Uh, and very strong. They wanted something that had two edges on it, if you will. Uh, a front edge, which is that Tonto style upsweep, and then a, a cutting edge so that if they had to use the, uh, in other words, you take a knife that's one long continuous curve, let's say, in a folder that might only be three and a half inches long, the blade, uh, and you're cutting something, uh, you're going to compromise the entire blade pretty much from from the, the tip to the end of the of the edge. And once a knife is dull, then it's it loses its you know, right. ability to cut easily. And so they wanted to have a second edge on it. And I said, well, why don't we do a Tonto style? Because again, I'm, you know, I was into all the Oriental uh, knives and swords and all that good stuff. Right. And they said, yeah, that, that sounds good. Because the first knives that I made for them were chisel ground, but they were one long continuous kind of a Bob Loveless, you know, s- you know, one curve up to the drop point of the, right. of the knife. And so... We went with the Tonto style, uh, did a few iterations of that, and uh, hit on a knife called the, at the end, it was just a, an Emerson knife uh, with a Tonto blade in it and a, an ergonomic handle that kind of fit in both, you know, any kind of grip. And it was the sixth uh, one we had made, and there's a, there's a backstory to this too, but I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, so uh, sixth iteration of the knife. They liked it. This had gone on now for six, seven, eight months, and they were up at my house one day because I got to be friends with them and all that. And one of the guy goes, "You know, Ernie, we haven't really been forthright with you about who we are and what we do." And I go, "Okay, <laughs> I, all right." So, you know, I never really ask any questions or anything. And so uh, they said, "Well, we're we're actually SEAL Team uh, members." And we're from a special unit in the in the SEAL teams. And then lo and behold, I found out that was SEAL Team Six. So I thought, oh, what a what a great name for the knife, the close quarter combat six. Yeah. Yeah. So coincidentally, the, the sixth iteration you said, right? Yeah, it was just oh, weird. Cool. Stuff like that happens, I guess. <laughs> uh but anyway, what happened was uh I ended up making the knives for them for quite a while. And um uh, you know, it's, it's like everything else. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a Marine or a Ranger or, or any any service member. You love to show your gear off to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. And so they started showing these knives off to everybody and their brother. And holy smokes, it took off like, like crazy. And uh, that's when I got a call from a guy who worked at Benchmade. And he was down at some military show in Florida and called me from the floor and he goes, Mr. Emerson, I, I work for uh, Benchmade, and oh my God, all these guys we're running into down here have got these handmade knives. They call it the six, and you know we need to talk. <laughs> so that that was the door that opened up. Uh, I said sure, because again, oh my gosh, a knife company wants to make make one of my knives. You right. know what the heck? How cool is that? So that led to the the collaboration with Benchmade, and then you know one thing led to another, but. Uh, yeah, that the again, I've just I've just been in the right place at the right time. And I've always said, you know, my best I think my best talent is being able to listen to the needs of the people that I was working for right. and to give them something that reflected is to my best ability, which generally hit it pretty close to the to the target for what someone needed. Because again, it, it was never my position or intention ever to tell you what you need right right uh you tell me what you need and then it's my job to figure out how to how to address that well i think another thing that might uh um, explain your success is that you're very clear about what you do Uh, these are unabashed weapon knives and of Mm -hmm. course they have all sorts of ancillary uses like like cutting off the errant thread off your collar or whatever it is, <laughs> but but they're yeah. they're they're meant for uh, harm's way and and to and to at least uh, stand up and excel in that situation, and and that's something that's always appealed to me about about your work. Well, you know, 
it reflects of who I am because, you know, again, it, it, people say, you know, what do you want on your on your gravestone? And my epitaph would be he was a fighter. And that that's who I've always been. That's what I've identified myself as. And, and I don't mean a, a I'll, you know, again, sounds kind of hokey, but uh, I mean, I'm a fighter. I'm a physical fighting son of a gun. I, <laughs> I love I love fighting. I love it, it's weird. I love violence and I feel at home in the midst of it. It it never was something I was uncomfortable with. And I'm not I'm not a bully. I didn't go right, out right. and I, I was the guy who always basically I can look back on my childhood and almost every single one of the scraps that I got in, I, I stepped in because somebody was being bullied or somebody was being beaten on by some other son of a gun. Well, I, I don't think that that's a terrible thing to admit. I, I think that uh, I, I've heard recently, I've heard um, a new interpretation or, a, or a, an alternate interpretation of the, the meek shall inherit the earth. And the meek not being weak and uh, cowed, but the meek being uh, those who, who have swords, know how to use them, but prefer yep. to keep them shield, uh, sheathed unless, yep. you know, need be. And then you can become, Absolutely. become a monster. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... That's kind of the the way that I've viewed life. And again, when I say, you know, what's wrong with me at times, uh, you know, because I like violence. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know. Maybe there is something wrong with me, but I reconciled myself to that a long time ago. And as far as the knives are concerned, of course, they were a reflection of what my interests were. In other words, at the time, and again, it, it's partly business decision. There's no way around that, too, because... Uh, if I if I made a size twenty nine tennis shoe, even though if it was the best tennis shoe made on earth, there's not a lot of people that are going to buy it. Right. But if I made a tennis shoe that a lot of people would wear, uh, I'm going to sell a lot of tennis shoes. And it was the again that tactical uh, genre, if you will, was exploding, and I plugged myself into it because that's what I did best, you know, and and that's the way, that's who I was and what I was doing, and so. Our knife company was the very first, and I, I believe pretty much still the only knife company that ever existed that said, hey, we, we make weapons. And even when I was working with Benchmade, uh, some of the conversations we had was like, oh, you know, we can't get too, we can't be too offensive mm. by or aggressive, you know, because of liabilities and a whole bunch of other different, you know, things that, you know, as far as images of companies and right. i remember one of the big companies one of the big companies told me oh ernie we never we never let our knives ever be used in movies if if they're being used by the bad guys and i was like <laughs> are you kidding me i want the bad guys to have my knives in their hands that's that's the you know that's they, the they always have the coolest kit right yeah <laughs> the baddest weapon i i went you know i had no you know i'm just like you don't want to be too aggressive, for God's sakes. What about SIG? What about H and K? What about Colt? They make guns. Mm -hmm. Those guns—they're designed to do only one thing, and that's kill something. Right. Uh, me saying I have a tactical knife that you can use as a weapon or a defensive weapon—I'm okay with that. And I think the I think the people, the the public, will understand that. And lo and behold, did they ever understand it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what um, what kind of feedback have you gotten, or do you get from from users? I, I'm a I'm a suburban dad. I love your knives. They mm -hmm. they help me cut muffins, uh, you know, and they they make me feel secure when as I walk. As long as they do that, <laughs> they make me feel secure when I walk around. Okay, but uh, I'm not a, a high speed low drag guy. What do you hear from uh, from the you know people out in the field using these? Do they hold up? Uh, yeah, it, it's funny because I just happen to have right here. I'm going to show you so you can okay. see it. Sure. Because we're we're doing a lot of recording of uh, and uh, memorializing a, of a lot of the stuff that we have, and I and I have these right now. Oh, look at that! He's got binders full of letters here. Yeah, these are these are testimonials from customers, wow. and they are only the ones that I took the time to put into these folders because we're going to be doing a, a couple put that down they're getting pretty heavy uh there's there's thousands of them and they're everything from uh i cut myself out of the skin out of a downed helo to uh you know i cut a guy uh who is committing suicide with piano wire you know hanging from a so-and-so or whatever wow. uh tracheotomies uh cut people out of seat belts a 
ton of military stuff, a ton. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds. So yeah, they're out there and they're being used hard. And, and I'm so proud of that. In fact, I'll tell you a, a real quick story about the sure. wave. One of my best friends uh, is, is a guy, let's call him Grizz. And uh, he is just a, he's salt of the earth. And he had uh, a couple sons. One of them became, a, uh, went in the army and became uh, a ranger. And at the time, right after 9-11, they were some of the first guys with the uh, ODA, triple nickel and all that that is deployed into uh, Afghanistan. They were in Tora Bora and they were literally about, a, about an hour and 15 minutes or so behind Osama bin Laden. Wow. That's how close they were to, to tracking this SOB down and, and grabbing him. But they went into the caves in Tora Bora. Now, if you knew sh my friend Grizz, he's also a very intense guy. And when his son uh, joined the military, Grizz gave him a CQC-7 and made him practice opening the knife and made him practice and made him practice and made him practice because that's the kind of guy <laughs> Grizz is. And uh, his son is in Tora Bora. And I get a phone call. And it's my friend Grizz. And I can tell by his voice, it's like, oh, God. No, this is not one of those calls. I, I, this is not going to be good. And he said, Ernie, Ernie. And I was like, what, man? He goes, your knife saved my son's life. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, and he tells me the story. They were in the caves. They had unshouldered their, uh, their M4s and put them down because the caves had been, quote unquote, cleared. And I mean, it's like a it's like a business office down under there. There's desks and file cabinets and computers and all kinds of crap. And uh, so they're going through there. And all of a sudden, his son comes around uh, and up from behind this desk, this guy with a turban comes up with an AK-47. Grizz's son grabs the muzzle of the gun very close to the to the uh, to the end of the muzzle, jams it up over his head cannot even, I mean, doesn't have his primary, he's got his secondary, can't get to it, grabs his pocket, pulls out a CQC-7, wave opens it, jams it forward, right straight into the center of mass of the guy. The guy falls back forward, and then a couple of other rangers who were now there hose the guy down. They grab Grizz's son by the back of his uh, assault vest and dragged him out. And uh, so, yeah, wow. we, we get that that just happened to be one of my best friends, his son. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. But, yeah, we, we get those kind of things all the time. And, uh, it, you know, you think about it. Like I said, I like violence. I'm a fighter, et cetera, et cetera. But when somebody tells you that something that you've done has saved their life or the life of someone they knew or a stranger, doesn't matter, saved someone's life, how could you ever... How could you ever top that? I mean, it's, yeah. it's I, I, I can't even describe the feeling that it, it gives you. That's like a mission check. Super. Now what are you yeah. going to do? Now you can move yeah. on, learn ballet or something. Uh, it's crazy. And, uh, but again, you know, these are, they're hard use tools. They weren't, yeah. they weren't made to be fancy. And I always looked at it and said, look, if I, if I, if I make a knife that stands up to the rigors and, and uh, abuse uh, that the Navy SEALs can, can give to, the knife, then uh, I've pretty much covered almost everybody else that's yeah. ever used a knife. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> this kind of goes with the um, fact that they're on deployment so much, but I love that you use 154CM. It's one of my favorite steels, mm -hmm. and uh, it gets screaming sharp. It keeps a good edge. It sharpens easily. Uh, it seems like it's the perfect field steel, and I like that. Um, you know, like, how do you sharpen M390 in the field once it's chipped and all that? <laughs> Not that Not I'm dissing M3190. <laughs> it's a nice but urban you know steel. Let, let me talk about steel for a minute. Yeah. The reason that we use 154 is, again, uh, I'm a little bit of a weird duck, I guess, in certain ways. But 150, uh, Crucible Steel came to me in the very beginning. Uh, there was one other country, company uh, that was actually using it. Uh, it was Microtech. And we had been using it. And they came to me and said, Ernie, we will continue to make the steel uh, because we got a, we've got a, uh, an agreement with Tony uh, at Microtech, Tony Marfion. We'll continue to make the steel if you guys will continue to buy it and use it. And I said, for gosh sakes, that's the steel I want to use. So, uh, yeah. 
And so there's a loyalty factor, you know, that's mm-hmm. also part of that. Uh, with Crucible in the very beginning, now they've they've gone on to great, you know, all kinds of different things that they do with different steels. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I looked at it and said, it's the steel I've been using and the newer steels that are out there that you can take up to all these crazy Rockwell hardnesses and all that. I said, I'm not even, I'm not even approaching that on, on the 154. Uh, 154, you can take up to like a 60, 61. I don't even go near that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we go to 57, 59 because again, making knives that are used as hard as any knife can ever be used on the planet Earth uh, is a different story than making knives that most people will never push push to those extremes. And so, you know, again, another just kind of a mantra that I've abided by is, uh, you know, a broken knife is no knife, but a dull knife still a knife because, <laughs> uh, you know, I can sharpen it. Right. And uh, if it's broken, it's it's no good to me. And if I have to, uh, and I mean honest being in the field for god's sakes uh i've i've sharpened knives on a on a rock i mean because i had nothing else to to sharpen them on piece of pipe uh uh windshields you know or windshield. windows i just all kinds of stuff pieces of broken porcelain etc and you can't do that with knives that are diamond hard you know and all that good stuff and so again making a knife geared for hard use environments by people that are going to dull a knife uh and, I, and i'll guarantee you i don't care I can say this with firsthand experience. I don't care what the steel is. You can put any alphabet name you want on it and combination of numbers. I will dull that knife mm-hmm. and I'll probably dull it in the first two or three hours of me using it. If I'm, if I'm in an environment where I'm using my knife. So again, it's, it's moot point for me to, to be driven by the needs of people who don't reflect the people that are actually using my <laughs> knives. And, I'll tell you a little insider story. Now, this is very interesting, and I hope it doesn't get me or anybody else in trouble, but I've been waiting to tell this story for a long Ooh, time. good. <laughs> the, there's a story about a steel that's out there that is one of the new super steels, mm-hmm. and everybody's touting it and everything. And there was another steel that was the precursor to that super steel. And let's call that AB10. And... AB10 was a really good steel that everybody was very interested in and a lot of companies and knife makers and knife users were talking all about. And then there was a guy who worked with that company that produced that steel that said, I want to make something to use for uh, kitchen cutlery. And I have an idea for a formula. I want to take the AB10 and add some uh, elements to it that will give it a little more ductility, make it a little softer, a little easier to sharpen, etc. And so the company and that that individual made the uh, that new steel formula. And then the they said, "What are we going to call it?" And the guy that was the originator of the formula said, "Well, let's call it AB5." And they said, no, 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 we can't call it AB5 because it looks, <laughs> Lesser. looks in, it looks inferior to AB10. We want to sell it. And he goes, okay, so let's call it AB25. And they're like, okay, cool, AB25. AB25 became the, the super steel of the industry. But even the people who make the steel, who I know personally, and I know the, I know the guy who came up with the formula they were like dude it's an inferior steel <laughs> it's not as good as ab10 we've it's softer it has a tendency to chip out on the edge a little bit but it became the super steel and the magazines picked up on it and all the what i call techno whiz guys out there were like why aren't you using ab25 that's the greatest steel on the planet earth and blah 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 and and really slamming me in, in a lot of ways and that over my inferior steels and all that and I'm like, dude, you know what? I guarantee you, I guarantee you, even if that was a super steel, you are never, ever going to push 154 yeah. to its limits, let alone some steel that you could cut 10 million pieces of rope with. You'll never, I could give you that same knife with 154 in it. I guarantee you, I, I've done this with people on in testing environments. 
They had no idea they had 154 cm steel in their knife. Oh, this is outstanding. I'm so glad you're up. That's because they're spending all their time on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, we've, we've had to bend to it, and, and we do use some of the newer steels. And, uh, you know, again, I, I still have to sell knives. Sure, and, sure. That doesn't hurt you know, to give some variety. It doesn't yeah. mean... Uh, I'm not one to say it's my way or the highway or that I'm not... If you show me a better steel or, or, or a better anything... Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll change horses in midstream any day of the week if it's an improvement over what I'm doing. I, I've no emotional attachments to any of that stuff. But again, you know, like you said, there's a variety and, and there's a market for it. So in our uh, our more high end knives and all that, we do use some of the brand new mm-hmm. quote unquote super steels out there. Well, so this this makes me think of trends. Uh, the one thing I love about Emerson knives is um, uh, you're not uh, quick adopters. Trends come and go and um, you know, uh, like you started using bearings on a few of your knives and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you have the occasional uh, frame lock when it's necessary or it, it all seems purpose driven. It's not just like, oh, hey, uh, one one thing that you did innovate is the front flipper. Uh, <laughs> every every yeah. one of my Emerson's I can I can open like a front <laughs> flipper off the tank. So we can we can put that on your roster of innovations. <laughs> well, you know, again, the whole thing is, is a lot of the stuff. uh I would self-discover as we were doing. I mean, again, I'm not, I, I'm not a guy sitting there with a, uh, um, a pad and pencil spinning out brand new innovative ideas all the time and all that. A lot of this stuff just, oh, wow, it does that. Well, that's, we're going to have put that on, you know, all the knives. And, you know, again, you know, being driven by, you know, f- function and function alone, it's been my, um, I guess, anchor point for everything that I do because if it it, again it's the same thing with all the classes that I teach if I can't do it I won't teach it right and if the average man can't do it I'm not going to teach it because again just to get off on on another little side road same thing with the knives if I teach you something in a class that you might walk out that door and put your life on the line based on something that I have that I have just taught you that you should do in a, in a situation like this. There is a moral responsibility that I have to be aware of because, again, you've put your safety and maybe well-being of, of your family or loved ones into my hands. And I hold that in a, in a very, very high regard, and it's the same thing with the knives. Uh, it either works or it doesn't, and nothing's on there for show and nothing's on there for uh, unless it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Well, tell me about your design process. How do you come up with your designs? Well, a lot of it is evolutions of products, knives that I've already designed. Let's, let's put a different blade and this type of handle and see how that works and things like that. So there's, again, there's some morphing that's taken place over time. I always look at things and, you know, you, you you get to a point where you're able to see something. I mean, I can I can look at a knife and I can tell you exactly how it feels in my hands without ever touching it. Mm-hmm. And that's just a that's no magic. It's not because I have any special gift. It's just the fact that I've done it for so many years now, uh, and and so intensely that it's it's part of that. And one of the things this is interesting. I'll I'll bring this up too. There's a spatial relationship that or a spatial uh, cognitive uh, ability that some people develop, some people have. Uh, I think it, it has to do with how much you played with uh, uh, building blocks mm-hmm. and things like that, maybe when you were a, a little tiny child. Uh, but one of the things that I was able to do s- that promoted my, I guess, ability to move up the ladder at Hughes Aircraft so quickly was the ability to do uh, – I had a, a spatial uh, – not not special, a, a spatial uh, cognitive ability that a lot of other engineers didn't have. And that's one of the reasons I was able to move up the ladder so quickly at Hughes was I could look at a two-dimensional drawing, say a blueprint, and I could, uh, in my mind, I, could, I was seeing the three-dimensional object and I could rotate it and I could see where things mm-hmm. were going to interfere or fit or not work or whatever. And that was something I believe just, again, growing up on a farm, you built and you did everything. Uh, you know, you didn't, 
You didn't call the mechanic to come and fix anything. You right. had to fix it yourself or build it or make it or whatever. And and that gave me that ability to, as far as tools are are, are concerned, I can do a drawing and I know that it's, it's going to be a how it feels in my hand but with never ever picking up the object, you know, and, and if it's, I can tell where there's going to be a pinch point or a, or a something that interferes with something. Do you do, uh, do you draft it all by hand? Are you a draftsman or are you hand it off to someone who does it, puts it in a computer? How does that work? That's, that's exactly how it works. Uh, I draw them and I hand them off to my uh, associate, uh, Danny, who's in the next room. And he, he uses CAD to uh, basically trace the uh, drawings. And we have uh, all of the internal uh, mechanisms pretty much uh, worked out for all different various sizes of knives over the years because we've, mm -hmm. we've made quite a few knives. And uh, so he plugs in the appropriate bolt, uh, pivot bolt, uh, stop pin, uh, lock uh, relationship that would fit that size of knife. And mm -hmm. off we go. We, we, oh, that's so cool. Well, here's the deal. And it's funny because uh, I, can, I could draw a knife right now. And if, if we were at the beginning of this podcast, at the end of the podcast, I could, I could have a working prototype, not a ground knife, but the yeah. piece parts in my hand uh, to show you because he's that good. He's that quick. And we can send it directly to our laser cutting machine that's in the other room over there and uh, produce the part. So I can, I can tell almost within two or three hours if this is a knife that we're going to put into production or not. It's a cool thing. That that's amazing. I mean, that's so quick. That prototype. This <laughs> is Danny. His name is Danny. Yeah, Dan. Well, Danny, uh, I, I have two two knives for you to 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 draw up. <laughs> One of them is the A one thirty one handle with a CQC thirteen blade, and then the other <laughs> is a Roadhouse handle with the sax blade. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that, these are these are what I think, <laughs> This is what I think about. These are the kind of things I hey, think man. about. <laughs> you and me. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool that you have a, a very streamlined uh, process from your brain to something you could have in your hand right there under your roof. This is weird too, because uh, you talk about the design process. I'll go three, four, five months and not put my pencil to, to paper. And then all of a sudden in, in a, <laughs> I, I don't know what triggers it. I've, I've looked for that and searched for it, but usually it's something that uh, I do that's completely different. In other words, uh, I'm going to build a longbow. So I go and start doing research on longbows and getting the wood and the designs and et cetera, et cetera, and start working on them and shaping the, you know, looking at the grain structure, blah, 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 blah all those good things. All of a sudden, boom, I'll walk into my office or I'll go home because uh, I always have all my work with me uh, and I'll turn out 10, 12, 15 <laughs> different knives. It just comes in waves like that, but it's usually triggered, I believe, by some completely uh, right turn, if you will, hmm. uh, off the off the freeway. And for some reason, I just believe it. It triggers uh, create, you know, creative part of the process. Now, you know, one of the things that uh, kind of supports this is if you th think uh, they were doing tests at one point with some people in some of the nursing homes. And they would give them a uh, gen like a generic uh, or arithmetic or mathematics test, mm -hmm. and they would score them and all that. And then they'd come back and say, "Now we're going to learn how to play chess, or we're going to learn conversational French, or something like that. Something completely unrelated." Uh, and they would spend several uh, weeks or months doing that, and then they would give them that mathematics test again. And all almost without exception, uh, they would always score higher. Wow. And yeah, and it's it's again, you know, you, when you look at the human um, neurophysics and things like that, it's very interesting what creates the creative process and what you can do to get your brain uh, tricked into kind of performing the way you want. And I've I've been a student of that <laughs> forever and ever. So I've I've tried all kinds of tricks to make it happen. Some of them work. So basically, you're saying expanding your mind by forcing yourself to do something totally unrelated, Absolutely. something hard, taking on something difficult that yeah. makes you, uh, yeah. Well, that's that's also true uh, physically. Uh, and again, I, I think our lives uh, or the universe, if you will, is go is governed by principles, and the principles don't care where they're applied. They don't uh, they don't care if they're good or bad, or if you're good or bad. They just are. And I think the application of stress which you can 
graphically see in people that are bodybuilders and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, you stress the muscle, the muscle grows larger to take the stress on. I believe the principle is the same for for everything because, you know, being a, a mad, insane workout maniac, uh, I, I can physically tell you, you know, when it's happening that it does happen. And I think that for your brain, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, your heart, your brain, everything. It's like that necessity is the mother of invention thing you were talking about before with the war and how yeah, yeah. and how that that stress created stress the produces results. Yeah, you know. So uh, before we uh, started rolling, you you told me a little bit about your awesome collection because I commented on the mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a thousand year old at least Viking battle axe hanging on the wall behind Mister Emerson. It looks so cool. <laughs> You said when you come out with something different. For me, when you came out with the sax two years ago, uh, I was just like, thank God, because A, I love the, the blade shape, but I also knew because I had seen uh, the videos where you were just starting to noodle around with um, the idea of making some some Viking battle axes, mm -hmm. Emerson Viking battle axes. I was so happy to see that because uh, <laughs> the blade shape, uh, I mean, you make a killer Bowie, let me say, and, and Tanto as well. So it was nice to see a totally different shape. Thank you very much. So how does your, your heritage, uh, your background affect your designs and your interests? Well, I'm, I'm big on legacy. I'm big on ancestry. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons we're going to Ireland, uh, like I mentioned earlier. I, I just love that stuff. I'm, I'm a history. That was one of my majors in, in college. Uh, I majored in history and then physical education. So I've been really enamored um, with uh, history, ancient history to be more exact. Uh, but as I grew into being a knife maker, of course, I was very, and the martial arts, I was extremely interested in historical weaponry. And the thing about historical weaponry is the, the designs that stayed the course that were actually there uh, and continued to be there over centuries, maybe, or sometimes millennia, uh, those were the good designs because the poorly designed weapons died on the battlefield mm -hmm. and probably soon after the guy who invented it because the family <laughs> would come after him and go, <laughs> what, are, what you gave my grandfather didn't work. <laughs> uh, so my point being is that uh, those people that use those weapons, literally life or death, hand-to-hand -hand combat and or utility and or farming or whatever, they had to be good. They had to work. They had to be efficient. They had to be easy to make. And, uh, you know, those are the combination of things that uh, still apply as a as a principle again to any any tool. So yeah, am I influenced by the by the historical stuff? Hell yes, I am. I mean, show me somebody that can improve upon a, a Japanese sword. Well, then, so how how do you view some of these really? Um, uh, and I don't mean crazy in a bad way, uh, but what do you think of some of these very sculptural, very heavily milled, uh, super heavily designed um, <laughs> knives that that make up the the popular <laughs> knife world these days? Well, I don't think anything of them at all, actually, because in my world they don't exist. And uh, I'll be real. I, again, I'm not one to mince words, and I really, you know, I'll I'll stand and and. This is not a place for word mincing, sir. Yeah, no, it isn't, and I and I appreciate that, and and I will always suffer the consequences of my actions. So I'm willing to to say things and do things at times that, you know, it's like I'll just play the cards that are dealt. But let's just say this: the worst knife designers on the planet Earth are martial artists because they always come up with some crazy, you know, it can do this, and you can crack their skull and then you can jab them with the thing that hooks on their <laughs> underneath their chin and pulls them down you know and all this time going oh my god never been in a real fight in your entire life <laughs> <laughs> and that and i mean honest there's some guys that are pretty famous out there and i look at some of the stuff and uh, i'm like oh my god there's no one on earth that's ever going to take that into a into a real-time environment now this is funny because uh i just was having a conversation with danny yesterday there's been, there were have been a couple of incidents at like the blade show because everybody shows up to the blade show, hmm. and one guy shows up one time and he's like Ernie I got to show you I've got the ultimate the ultimate ultimate you know weapon system and all that, and within a couple seconds he's standing in front of me with two live blades on the ends of like lanyard that you know do you remember the uh, 
when you were a little kid and your mom, you had the mittens that had the string that you yeah, would run all yeah, the way, yeah. uh-huh. all the way through your sleeves across sleeve. your shoulder. Yeah, and yeah. You never lost your mittens. Well, he had two knives connected oh, like that oh and he's spinning them in front of me and i'm sitting there going holy crap this that guy, sounds safe <laughs> I, he's either going to cut me or himself uh luckily he didn't cut anybody but we had to have him escorted um, and again he's a <laughs> he's a secret ninja martial arts guy and all that yeah. we, i had him ex- escorted from the show because I said, this guy's a freaking danger to because i saw him going to a couple other places and doing that and you know how it, you're at a, a show it's kind of like yeah. you know you're at, you're at there's it's dozens tightly of packed. people. Yeah, you're next to people. Then I had another guy show up uh, who said he had the ultimate self-defense tool, another martial arts guy. And he reached down to his belt and he pulled out this f- long piece of spring steel that was about, I don't know, maybe two feet, 24 inches long. That was, you know, I don't know if it's 25 or 30 thousandths thick. It was all flexible and stuff. And one edge of it had been sharpened and it's, it's waving around oh and, my and like wiggling and all that. And he's going, yeah, this will do this and that. And I'm going, oh my God, there's another guy who's going to kill somebody. Yeah, here. it's just randomly cut, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, cool. Uh, thanks. But, you know, we're not into belt, you know, that kind of stuff. Sorry, man. Maybe you should go to some, some other company and ask them. But I mean, these are guys that you know they. You got to let them down easy because, for gosh sakes, they're they got a live weapon in front of you, and yeah, uh, right, and, right. And it's their baby, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think that's for me. But why don't you go check with Benchmade? <laughs> yeah, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done a bunch of collaborations. We were talking about uh, Benchmade. You've done ProTech. The uh, CQC7 mm-hmm. continues to, to be very popular. They just actually mm-hmm. just came out with some new iterations with Micarta, which is the coolest and very most cool. wonderful material in the world. Yeah. Uh, but I am a big uh, uh, Zero Tolerance fan, and I have your mm-hmm. Zero Tolerance uh, collaboration knives and a few of the Kershaws also. And what I really love about them, besides everything, is... Uh, well, I've I've gotten my carta on all of them, so mm-hmm. they're they're now mine, and I've put uh, real um, Emerson clips on them, so they don't say. So I've I've customized them to my own <laughs> liking. But but what I like about it is that I can have my my real Emersons, my liner lock Emersons, and then if I'm in a a, a fidgety mood and I feel like playing with a a, li- a, a, a frame lock, mm-hmm. I can pick up one of my one of my others, and I. Let me let me just tell you my about my first Emerson. Now that I'm sitting here looking at all my Emersons, it was a a, um, a commander purchased in 1999 mm-hmm. uh, from that goes back ways. Yes, it does. But but it, this is a 2000, so I mm-hmm. bought it in 1999 from the Knife Center, and I didn't realize you know this was probably the first thing I ever bought online. I didn't realize. That, uh, well, actually, the only other thing I had bought before that was a computer and it, it came to me the next day. So I figured yeah. you buy it on the internet, it comes the next day. Well, I, I had just started, uh, Filipino martial arts and was really taken in by recurve blades. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the more recurve, the better. Yeah. And I saw, I saw your knife. I saw, um, the commander in the pages of, uh, Knife Center and just could not, I mean, it just kept, it was like my, my, um, my background on my, you know, so I just yeah, yeah. obsessed over it. Finally, uh, spent it the money out on it. To you. It did. Finally, spent a new all about the wave. Oh my god, you know, I'm gonna beat everyone to it. And uh, finally, got up the gumption to buy it, and it didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come. And lo and behold, <laughs> you were uh, the Emerson uh, factory or whatever was was tooled for a different knife at that time, I guess. Yeah. And I was freaked out for a while, and then I just kind of just forgot about it. Life went on. And then about a year later, I'm in my soul crushing job and I go to lunch. I come back and there's a box. I'm like, what's this? <laughs> Open it up. I have my 2000 Emerson Commander. And, uh, you know, it's been one of my prized possessions ever since. Sorry about the wait. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you made me wait. Kind of, they have a thing called Emerson time that, that I've, been, <laughs> I've been accused of. And I guess they're, it's true. <laughs> So one of these days, I'm going to get myself a new, uh, an updated one, you know, 2020, I figure 20 years later, you, you, you've done a couple of things new and different, uh, definitely want to. Maybe we'll have one of those new super steel. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> now they're still made with 154, unless it's, unless it's a special run that we do or something. Then, 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 yeah, uh, definitely. So how is it working with uh, ZT? It's, it's working very well. We 
like like everybody else uh, that we've worked with, it's been a, a, a peachy keen uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, it's funny because uh, the guys the guys at Kershaw said, "You're the easiest, easiest guy we've ever worked with. Uh, you're very low maintenance." I said, "Hey, man, I just make <laughs> knives. You guys make knives. Yeah, I give you some designs. You make them. Just do them right, and, and it's all good." But what Kershaw is doing this year is they are scaling back on all of their collaborations. Uh, there's some some things that are going on uh, with um, different companies and stuff like that where people are tightening their belts and all that. So mm-hmm. uh, they're scaling back on all of them, but uh, that's only we're only on a standby, and that's that's across the board uh, for all of their collaborations. They want right. to establish their own identity, uh, so they're they're going to be. The pro- there won't be any brand new Emersons, at least for the time being. So, but, but we they still, are upgrading them with yeah. the D two and yeah, uh, and D two is a great steel too. That is great uh, steel. Again, it's like uh, you know, in my opinion, the the best knife steel that exists on the planet Earth is W one, and that's probably one of the simplest steels that that has ever been developed. In fact, it's basically iron and carbon, and that's it. Hmm. And if you look at your uh, files that you use to cut other steel with, those are all W1 steel. So the only drawback is that it rusts, and you can, you know, you can look at it and it starts to rust. So you know, again, when you talk about all these super steels and all that, the best steels that exist are are the simplest ones that exist. Again, what did we say in the very beginning? One who's master, an expert is one who's mastered the basics, and you can't improve upon the basics. You know. Yeah. So you now do a podcast yourself, the Ernest Emerson podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about that. How did that come about? And uh, what what uh, itch was that scratching? Well, I just happened to know a lot of interesting people. And we would have all of these conversations all the time. And I was like, damn, I'm really interested in what this person has to say. I mean, really interested. I think a lot of other people might be interested in it too. So again, you know, being a podcast listener, you know, Joe uh, Rogan and Jocko and all those guys, mm-hmm. I was like, wow, podcast would be a cool way to do it. Because again, you get that kind of long format where somebody can actually, you know, elucidate on, you know, their ideas and, and their thoughts. Uh, and so I said, let's give it a try. And we, we've put it on hold, but we're back in the game now again, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, starting back up. Uh, got real super busy and, you know, have to sacrifice one thing for the other sometimes sure. just because there's only 24 hours in the day. But uh, we're back. I'm going to I'm banking up a bunch of episodes that we can release uh, so that we have them done and I won't be crushed with. Oh, my gosh, I got to do another one this week. I forgot. Right. Because we are pretty busy. But I've also got. um I've got a new book that's going to be uh, hmm. coming out. Uh, it's called uh, The Warrior Book, Barbarian Combat Strength and Conditioning Manual. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, that's a cool one. Do you mind if I talk about it for a second? Please do. Okay. What I did was, you know, I've got the other books out there. I got Chain Reaction Training and Seven Strategies of Hand-to-Hand Combat. Got, there's, there's five or six of them out there right now. And this one is different than any other training book that that I've ever come across. And what I did was I I looked at it and I thought, knowing all of these warriors that, I, that I've known over the years and, and still continue to meet, uh, one of the things that they that I found is they're they're very uh, engaged in the history of their uh, craft. In mm-hmm. other words, the inspiration of other warriors that have gone before them. And, you know, everyone knows the story of the Spartans and Thermopylae and the 300 Spartans and all of those good things. And, and they're used and taught in in service academies throughout the world. And even, you know, in basic training, they'll you'll be inspired by all of these stories of previous uh, heroic ep- exploits by warriors. And I thought, wow, I'm going to do a training book, but I'm going to go back through time and look at all of these famous warrior societies or cultures that existed. So I did a, each chapter 
was a, a barbarian or a, or a military unit, whether it was the Varangian Guard or the Legionnaires or the Spartans or the Celtic warriors or the Visigoths or the Vandals or the Normans. I have chapters for all of these different hmm. uh, war societies. And then each chapter has a workout. That is the, <laughs> so cool. the, the Norman workout, the Viking berserker workout, the uh, Mongol workout, because I felt, you know what? These guys all love the history. Uh, let's give them all the history. Let's, you know, and again, I'm not, I didn't write a compendium of the history of warriors. Uh, they're all, uh, you know, short chapters on in the high, if you will, bullet points for, for these different uh, societies and guard units and tribes and all that. So are these workouts based on uh, workouts that would be good for, like, say, the Mongols for drawing a bow yeah. or that kind of thing? <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, for example, in a couple of the, like the samurai uh, one, I put in a bunch of wooden sword strikes against the bag because I wanted it to mm -hmm. represent some of the things. The It's not about pulling stumps out of the ground or, or heaving stones or anything <laughs> like that. It's all modern workouts. They're all workouts that I have done over the years. And still continue to do that. I rotate in and out. Uh, they're mainly high intensity slash cardiovascular slash strength slash stamina. Uh, you know all of those things. Because er, the thing about these all of these people uh, was it was all functional. And for example, I'll, I'll give you just a, a little tidbit. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Vikings landed at Lindisfarne uh, in Ireland for the first Viking raids, if you will, and attack the, uh, uh, the monastery up there. When they strode onto the beach, the monks and or the, the, the native people that, were, that lived there, they were like, holy smack, what's up with these guys? They're giants. Well, the, the Viking, two things. The Vikings ate meat and dairy products and fish. And most of mainland Europe uh, subsisted on, on a diet that consisted mainly of grain. Mm -hmm. So these guys were six to eight to 10 inches taller than everyone else. Plus, they had just rowed across 850 kilometers of the North <laughs> Sea. <laughs> so they're jacked. Yeah, they were jacked. And when they came on the scene, uh, there was nobody that could could stand against them. So... Again, that rowing and rowing is a is a I, I delve a little bit into to rowing in there too because it's a, one of the greatest training uh, modalities that you could ever find. Mm -hmm. But you know, think about these guys. If they rowed all day long, you were a farmer, we, the the local uh, uh, sheriff or whatever you would call them, and I don't mean L.A. County sheriff, but you know that they right. call them sheriffs, guys who ran the shires and all that. Called up a bunch of farmers and all that, so they grabbed their whatever pitchforks and spears and swords, and all of a sudden they walked into a situation where there were these guys that were oh. swinging these battle axes that could fight for like, dude, you're done in like five minutes, and I can go for five hours. Right, right, and they yeah. do it for fun. I mean, right, yeah, presumably there's there's a lot of yeah. a lot in their honor wrapped up in that. Well, yeah, and and it's it's just it's amazing. Again, you know. The warrior society or the warrior subculture that exists in the human race has always been held to a higher standard. And we've always had the, the warriors have always had a uh, code and honor was a huge, a very, very big part of that. And uh, it's funny uh, because, again, as, as in all the different ways that societies delineate down into subcategories and sections and all that, there, there's one that has always been also true and what it is is there are those that run to danger and those that run from danger there are those that will take up the shield and the sword and there are those that need to be protected now don't misunderstand what i'm saying in any way that i put a judgment on that as far as bravery versus cowardice or anything it's that's not what it's about it's nothing to do with with that at all it's just that there are people that are warriors and that there are people that are not the warriors. And that's just, a, again, a, a way that it's always broken down throughout history. And so this book addresses a lot of that. Uh, actually, it was a fun book to write. I, I enjoyed the living daylights out of it. And again, you know, I'm never going to put anything in there that I haven't either done or, or can do. And I know they all work and they're all effective. So, 
Well, let, let me ask you this. Uh, so every time I see pictures of you, I'm like, man, this guy's in such awesome shape. You are, and and I know, uh, you know, you're you're uh, you, you've got ten or fifteen years on me, and uh, and I'm, I just keep thinking, man, I I I want to stay in shape all the way into you know as I get older. So if someone is there uh, listening and needs to get started, what's the first thing? I mean, you say rowing. You mentioned rowing before. To me, that seems like a gentle way to get yourself back started. Well, it, it is, but you need uh, you need an erg machine or a rowing machine uh, to do that because most people don't have the uh, you know a skull or any of those kind of right, things that are right. out there. They they cost they're hugely expensive. They can go fifty to seventy five thousand dollars a piece. The rowing machines are between seven to eleven hundred dollars a piece. You can buy them if you look. Uh, on the internet and stuff like that, you'll see a lot of places they're used. But it's probably the lowest impact, but the highest intensity type of training that you could do. Uh, it's absolutely gentle on your body, but it is without a doubt, it is a screaming agony of effort. Uh, but it produces incredible results. So, uh, you know, rowing is a good way to start, uh, you know, bicycling. And I'm not saying to go out and and run around in the traffic, but uh, stationary bikes are good. Uh, again, you know, people have always asked me, you know, is there anything that you'd ever do differently in your life? And I, I always say, no, there's not one single thing that I would have done that's different. And then I go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I really would, if I could change things, I wouldn't have done stupid things with heavy weights. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I, when I was younger. Because <laughs> there's a thing about being strong that is very addictive. Yeah, yeah. And like you know, when you're when you're 25 years old, you want to be that guy. <laughs> right, right. And then you feel it 25 years later. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you want to get right down to basics, uh, I will say probably one of the greatest all around, uh, tra- it, you know, you get you get everything in one package is jujitsu uh, because it's some of the hardest work you'll probably ever do. You're you're when when you're done, uh, once you get rolling, uh, you're you're exhausted from your hair down to your toenails, and that's <laughs> that's no exaggeration. And uh, you get the tremendous physical benefits out of it. It is a literally a uh, an art that someone can participate in at the age of five or six years old, all the way up to eighty five or ninety mm-hmm. years old, uh, because it is a it's a you can meter the intensity that you do. Now, if I get in the boxing ring with somebody. That's a whole different story. That's that's a young stallion's game. I still do it. I still love it. But there's there's a point where there's diminishing uh, skill level. All right. Um, Got to turn up the Irish. Yeah, big time. Because <laughs> it all it only comes down to that, and that's all that's left sometimes. But you know, the jujitsu is a is a tremendous uh, workout. Uh, but you know, any resistance training at all, and just be smart because again, and I'm big on kettlebells and sandbags and slosh tubes and all of this stuff uh you know half of it you can make in your own backyard so right, to speak right. uh pull-ups push-ups i mean to me the pull-up is the one of the kings of exercises y- you can do any of that it's just a matter of uh i've always always told people look you have to understand something about training uh you don't fit training into your life you fit your life around training jeez and that's the only way that you're going to have long term. Feel that guilt now <laughs> just setting in on my shoulders, oh, pushing me down. Well, you know, I get up at zero four thirty every <laughs> single morning, so Knock you on. know I can. You know, people are like, I don't have time, and I'm like, dude, how much how much TV do you watch? Yes. Well, when we get home at night, I turn the TV on, and then at ten o'clock I go to bed. It's like okay, so about four or five hours. Could have done a lot. You you met your wife doing jujitsu, I think, right? No, that, no, but okay. uh, we ended up doing jujitsu. Uh, she was uh, actually one of the first female, one of the first gals that was ever taught Gracie jujitsu. Because hmm. up until a certain point, uh, Horian had decided that you know, again, you know, these guys are from Brazil. It's a macho thing. It's like yeah, yeah. You know, women don't get to do the the real jujitsu. But we have rape safe. So my wife went through like three different, you know four or five week sessions of rape safe and her and her girlfriend walked into Horian's office and they said, God damn it. We're tired of the rape safe. We yeah. Let us train. Jiu-jitsu. We can whoop most of these other white belts that are in here hands down. And, uh, 
at that point, uh, Horian relented and he, he, uh, he said, well, maybe we should start a women's class. And then they said, women's class? Why has it got to be women's class? We're not going to be fighting women out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to be. Like, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Not going to be attacked by another gal. So anyway, uh, they were. She was one of the first uh, women Gracie jiu-jitsu practitioners that was taught uh, here. I, I was very lucky because I, I only lived. I, I was literally two or three miles away from the Filipino Cali Academy when I lived here. And I was only. I was only about a mile away from the original Gracie school when uh, Horian and everybody came in and all the brothers taught them. That sure beats driving 80 miles back oh. and forth. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> <it ever>. <laughs> so uh, what, what do you see as the future of the Emerson Knife Company? I, I know your family is somewhat involved. I'm not sure what the involvement is actually, but how do you see uh, Emerson Knives uh, evolving into the future? Well, we are, we are at one of those uh, positions right now. Uh, we have gotten to the point where I've taken it as far as far as I can go. I've reached that point, mm -hmm. uh, and we've brought some people in that are going to take us to the next level. We're upping our production. We're upping all of our um, ancillary items and things like that that we're going to be doing. Uh, and by the way, the, the company is run by uh, my family. My wife is the mm. business. Okay. Uh, my daughter, Megan, is the um, in charge of marketing. And my daughter, Rachel, is uh, head of operations. So it's funny because here's another little side story. Guys will call up and they'll get one of those three. And there's other people that answer the phones, but they'll get one of my daughters or my wife on the phone. And a lot of times it'll be like, well, you know, I got these questions, but is, is there some? Is there a guy there that I can talk oh, to? Oh, come about on! <laughs> <laughs> no, no BS. And I'm. It's funny because I think these gals know more about knives in their little finger than most. And again, with all due respect to my customers, <laughs> the, they have grown up right. just like Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Those guys grew up on the mat. Yeah, there's no downtime in their lives when they weren't about not, uh, Jiu Jitsu. Same thing with these with my family they were born and raised into knives they know they know more than i do about knives and uh, it's just funny that that happens but it, it's you know we've got a we've we've had a reputation um as a kind of a tough guy knife company and it's run by women <laughs> and people don't understand that <laughs> and that's why it's so damn tough right there <laughs> right exactly exactly well ernest emerson uh, it's it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming I on. I love talking. Oh, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, hey, and, and thanks for thanks for all the awesome knives. And, and, and I got to oh. say, uh, I have more knives, I think, of your design than anything else. And, <laughs> and I feel a real kinship uh, always have with the, with the uh, Ino Santo connection. I, uh, yeah. All the people I've, the three of the people I've trained under have been direct you know from him and yep yep yeah he's uh amazing to be around yeah and again you know one of those guys that just keeps going and going yes. and going yes because he's just doing what he loves to do yeah well it, you know guy asked me one time he said ernie uh when are you gonna retire you know are you getting ready to retire and i said you know i <laughs> i haven't worked for the last 35 years oh. this isn't work for me it's it's who i am and what i do and i just love I love getting up every single freaking morning of the of the week. Well, amen. It hasn't worked a day in 35 years. <laughs> no, not one. Uh, well, except, I, except on the farm when I'm back home. <laughs> yeah, right. They put you to work as soon as you get there. Uh, yeah. Well, someone to emulate. Thank you, Ernest Emerson, for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's been I a really great pleasure, it, sir. Mark. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. And um, you're a great host. I really enjoyed talking to you because you're – definitely interested in knives and i want to congratulate you guys you've had some great guests on uh I've seen i looked at all the stuff tide raises all boats the more people you can get excited about knives the better it is for all of us knife makers out there so keep up the good work man. well thank you so much appreciate it you're listening to the knife junkie podcast call the knife junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments and we're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim Person here, along with Bob DeMarco. And Bob, just uh, an excellent interview there, man. I, I, A, you did a great job. Oh. Ernest Emerson, wonderful interview. 
interviewee. Had yeah. a lot of great stories. It was uh, really fascinating to listen to. Yeah. Well, you know, Jim, you always ask me uh, for my takeaway after an interview. And my takeaway this time is I would love to hang out more <laughs> with Ernest Emerson. He had, uh, you know, more and more and more stories to go. And, you know, they say don't meet your heroes because you're bound to be disappointed. Well, in this case, that uh, couldn't be further from the truth. So, man, yeah, it was absolutely. just such a pleasure to meet him, hear his stories uh, firsthand, uh, many of, many of uh, which I've heard you know, in the past in different interviews and stuff, but just to have him tell us here, it was great. Well, and if you like uh, hearing Ernest and hearing, you know, Knife Guys talk, I just, uh, you know, plug his podcast, which uh, he said had been on hiatus for a little bit, but coming back, Ernest Emerson podcast, also uh, a new book coming out. So a lot of a lot of great stuff going on there in his life. Yeah, that Warrior Workout book looks really cool. I just saw him on his 65th birthday. He did a video showing him doing one of the workouts. And man, did it make my 48-year-old self feel like right. a lazy slob. I'll have to live vicariously through him as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and not for nothing, I have uh, our good friend Alex Tussaud of Alex, Alex's Knife Box uh, just sold me his Iron Dragon, uh, named after Richard Bustillo. That's a that's sort of a limited release Emerson that came out, and I cannot wait to get it. Sorry, cut that out. That sounds so fruity. And I cannot no, wait to get I it. Am not, I am not cutting it out. <laughs> it's going to stay in there. Okay. And uh, I'm sure we'll see a video on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at some point, thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for being here with us on uh, episode number 94 of the Knife Junkie podcast, the weekend episode edition where we get to uh, talk to the folks in the knife world. So uh, thanks so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed the interview, and we'll be back again on Wednesday for a midweek supplemental show. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person saying thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.